Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another instalment of my series, Revisiting, where I look back on one particular album which seems to have some significance to my musical journey. And today I'm really delighted to welcome back to the channel for the second time, I believe, Mr. Rob Ison. Hi, Rob. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thanks, James. So today we're going to look at another great British rock classic. And uh, this is, of course, Medal by Pink Floyd, boasting a cover which I don't think was a favourite of the band. It was designed by Hypnosis, as usual. I don't think they were particularly enamoured with it either. Mm. And uh, apparently, Rob, there was... Um, for years and years, there was some speculation about what this image actually was. And I think now history does record that it's a human ear seen underwater, underwater. underwater. Yeah. Um, so what do you reckon? It's distinctive to an extent, but maybe not up there with your dark sides and you wish you were here's and your animals. I don't know. I quite like no, it. No, I mean, I mean, it's kind of in keeping with some of the images that they, they'd had up to that point, really, wasn't it? Mm. I mean... Uh, they're not really, you know, a lot of, I think, the Floyd stuff, you know, I mean, Atomart Mother, the predecessor, a case in point, you know, with a kind of just a single image of a cow in the middle of a field. I mean, you could mm. interpret that in a myriad of different ways. <laughs> okay. On the inside jacket is the great photograph, which um, really gives the lie to this idea that Pink Floyd were always completely faceless and anonymous and nobody knew what mm. they looked like. You know, Mendel has this... Um, I think quite interesting photograph, this black and white photograph, because the band just look so um, ordinary mm. and they just look like, I read a quote somewhere, I think it might have been in this book, um, Mark Blake, The Inside Story of Pink Floyd, I think he makes the point that the band just look like their audience. That was oh, yeah. the thing about Floyd, they just look like these long haired guys with his, you know, um, Nick Mason's got his um, centre parting there. Mm. You know, Rick Wright's got the beard, and they uh, yeah. they just look very ordinary, don't they? Mm. The serious. They look very self-serious about their music, though. You know what I mean? It's they do. Kind of, they do. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess this is what's going to get us into the album a bit as we get into this. This idea of Floyd uh, no longer really being what you might describe as, you know, cosmic pioneers. Sid Barrett mm. is, is long gone by this point and they've lost that charismatic side to them in terms of their physical presentation. And I suppose metal really does start that, that era that we all know where the Floyd themselves just melt into the background as these shadowy figures and the music and the stage set all takes over yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah mm. but before we get into yeah. any of that let's just do a bit of personal history so okay. rob do you, do you want to fill us in with just how you how you came across this album where it fits into the floyd into your personal floyd story was it an early one or was it a later one or mid-period uh it, it was an early one actually yeah i mean it was kind of before i got a copy of the wall or sort of dark side which were the two that i probably played the most in the 80s um, and it was a friend of mine uh, called Andy who had a copy. I think he had an original copy, which was originally his dad's. And he bought it over. And like you say, the, the, the cover was just kind of didn't really give an awful lot away. Um, so I was kind of intrigued right from the outset. I think really at that stage, I'd sort of heard money uh, and I'd heard some of the Sid Barrett early ones because a friend had the Relics album. Ah, so I'd heard some of the kind of the really early sid barrett stuff and you know obviously there's a couple of right songs on there as well mm. um but this was yeah completely completely new to me and uh yeah so uh that was i suppose that was about 1982 83 something like that mm. so sort of time when i really seriously started to get into record buying record collecting as such i suppose mm. um so this okay. particular copy um is one i picked up from a second hand shop in stratford for a pound <laughs> which uh was, was uh, you know astonishingly cheap really um i thought maybe they'd make a mistake and when i took it up to the counter they'd kind of say oh no 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 go on you know and they'd sort of check themselves and i'd be landed with a bill of about 30 odd quid but um it is it wasn't it's incredibly dirty incredibly noisy i had to clean it on my machine about 10 times to get it to even stop jumping on in the stylus but it actually doesn't play too badly now there's a little bit of crackle and stuff but uh yeah so for a 1971 early pressing i think i've got a, a pretty good deal there so but uh good yeah. stuff <clears throat> yeah i had uh, well i do have two copies i have an original copy which i think is probably 
maybe a late 70s early 80s repress but that always sounded quite bad so i did actually pick up the reissue a few years ago this is one of the yeah. Floyd reissues that came out i didn't buy all of them i bought medal and a couple of others mm. i've never actually owned medal on cd um oh. one of the few cds one of the few pink Floyd albums i've never picked up on cd i don't know why it just seems to be a record that you need to have on vinyl i think i had the original um, when they bought them out in the 80s i bought uh i, I bought the the metal cd there i wish i still had it because they're probably worth some some good money now but uh yeah, yeah maybe so, don't know what happened to it but there you go well i would have discovered the album at roughly the same time i uh i first saw the album i clapped eyes on it for the very first time in the record collection of my cousin mark who i've spoken about a few times on this channel because he had this record collection which i think was probably the first proper record collection that i'd ever seen really he was about 16 and i was probably about 11 or something like that he and he was never there in the house because he was he was kind of he was too old and cool to be hanging around with a 12 year old you know so he, so he would never be there but i would be there rifling through his records and having a look and yeah. i saw this record he was mainly into heavy metal and hard rock and okay. uh, you know his collection was very much based around things like uh you know deep purple black sabbath uh mm. you know that kind of thing but he had a few pink floyd albums when i saw this record in his collection i was already into floyd i think i'd already got the wall dark side obviously piper at the gates of dawn which is quite an early one for me but i knew mm. nothing about this record at all you know we're talking about that period long before there was the internet and i was too young to be reading music magazines so there was no way mm. i could kind of work these things out but i do remember pulling it out of his collection and just thinking mm. to myself i bet that's pink floyd <laughs> you know it's like that must be a pink floyd record it must <laughs> yeah. be and then you sort of looking at the spine and going actually yes it is yeah. yeah and i sat in his room and i listened to i just played the first track i played one of these days and i just thought it was just incredible and i just thought wow you know another great pink floyd record that i need to get um mm. when i got my own copy of it probably not that long after this album came out on the 30th of October 1971 they'd started recording it in January of 71 and the recording sessions were incredibly prolonged because it was during that period where Floyd were touring an awful lot in Europe mm. um actually we should just backtrack a little bit and say that Sid obviously had gone Sid left the band in 68 didn't he mm. and they'd had this interim period where they were kind of trying to feel their way into different possible versions of what Pink Floyd could be I suppose mm. and they were doing all this touring and they didn't wrap up the recording of the record until September of 71 so from January through to September you know they were essentially trying to work on this record but they kept having to take all the equipment down and mm. you know go on the road again and back again very much like how um, Yes recorded Close to the Edge they had a quite a similar story where they would do some recording and then they would have to load all the stuff into the van drive to Plymouth to do a gig or something come back set all the equipment up again and try and pick up halfway through the track they'd finished recording and it's a logistical is... nightmare and uh, <laughs> you know to try and get back into the spirit of what you were doing it's, uh, that's pretty, pretty tough isn't it absolutely really? yeah, yeah yeah and they did it with um they started recording it at Abbey Road, but Abbey Road at the time didn't have 16 track, I think. It was only 8 it was track. Only eight track yeah. So they moved to Air Studios, which was George Martin's studio, where there was uh, a 16 track recorder, and they were assisted. We were talking the other night, Rob, about who was it who engineered this record, and you, you said you thought it might have been Jeff Emmerich, and I couldn't remember. It wasn't Emmerich, but it was, it was no, John, it was John uh, Leckie. Yes, that's right. Yes, I did. I did look at yeah afterwards because um, he he engineered um, some of the uh, some of the Roy Harper stuff actually, yeah. as well. Um, so yeah, I think he was a tape operator, wasn't he? Or he was employed as a tape operator. Anyway, I was just going to say that. Yeah, I don't yeah. think he. I don't think he gravitated to engineer status yet. No. <laughs> so he was still yeah. operating the tapes, and there was a guy yeah. called Peter Brown as well, mm. and. Um, I guess just before then we get into into the album, what's your take on that kind of interim period between between sorts of full of secrets, which I think I think Sid Barrett was on that record. He plays a couple of bits and pieces on that. And of course mm. that, that album contains the song Jug Bang Blues, which was his parting shot really. And mm. then you get this period, don't you, where you've got some soundtrack stuff going on, but you've also got Umma Gummer 
which is the live album paired with this slightly disconnected studio disc. Mm. And then you've got Atom Heart Mother, which we've mentioned already. What's your take on that period? Because it doesn't always get a great press. And I suppose the reason that we want to talk about it is that this is the period leading up to metal where things seem to kind of come together in some way. Do you subscribe to that narrative, this idea that maybe there was a bit of a period where they weren't quite sure what they were doing, and then for mm. some reason on metal, it all seems to start to coalesce a little start bit? Start to come together. I think, yeah, I think after Sid went, I mean, obviously, he's the principal songwriter, um, mm. you know, um, so they go from this really successful kind of pop rock band with a, a, a leading figure who was just so instrumental in their overall sound and the songs that once he was gone it kind of just left this huge void um which i suppose was fortunate for the band to have somebody like gilmore who was just such a a musical kind of magician and could like just weave wonderful musical landscapes and sounds with his guitar um arguably obviously more accomplished musically than sid was um but yeah i think they were just uh I think they were just thrown into a bit of a a situation where they were just, as you say, feeling their way um, and struggling really just to find their identity, find a uh, you know a niche that they could sort of fall into. But then again, I suppose it was a it was a period after kind of psychedelia and the end of the sixties, you know, where experiment and experimentation was kind of the thing. Really, there were so many bands transitioning from. The, their sound that they'd had in the early days, you know, bands that come up through the 60s and then into the 70s, everything just changed and, you know, the political landscape had changed and attitudes were changing again. And I think all this kind of manifests itself in the music and the musicians trying to kind of crystallise that. I mean, by all accounts, when they first started to, to put studio time down for the album, they had virtually no direction or concept as such at all i don't think did they what they had was this project which they'd started talking about which was i think it's in retrospect it's come to be known as the household objects album all uh, right yeah are you aware of this yeah they were trying out different sounds just with kind of like you say household objects and putting echo on it and this kind of thing and um i think a yeah. lot of that wasn't that with sort of waters was working with geese and with that with kind of music from the body was that kind of yeah, that, that that had come at some point before then. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Ron, Ron Geeson obviously did the orchestrations on Atom Heart Mother, and that was, I, th yeah. I think, I think that was a project probably which was a wake up call for Pink Floyd, mm -hmm. really, because I think what they tried to do there was to collaborate, obviously, in quite a major way by bringing in this avant garde composer, and I don't think anybody was happy with the results. Geeson himself, um, I think he walked out of the premiere, didn't he? He was he, he just didn't think that they pulled it off at all. Mm -hmm. And Pink Floyd themselves, I I think, um, I think I think I think David Gilmore went on record saying that it was literally their lowest point. Atom mm -hmm. Heart Mother was it was where they were maybe completely directionless and thinking, like you say, maybe at the start of the decade, you know, seeing Deep Purple doing their their concerto or their symphony, whatever it was, you know, concerto mm -hmm. for, for group and orchestra, wasn't it? You know, yes, had done an orchestral, a sort of orchestral album. Their second album was orchestral. And by this point, you had ELP doing all, you know, orchestral stuff. Mm. So I think Atom Heart Mother was probably Floyd for the first time, maybe trying to follow the pack a little bit and go, well, let's, let's do our own orchestral thing and we'll stage it in a kind of classical concert hall. Mm. And I think pretty soon after they'd done it, they thought to themselves, yeah, that's, that, doesn't, that, that didn't really work really. And I think they probably did bottom out a little bit and they ended up with this project, Household Objects. Mm. But then, um, oh, and then also there was a random, there was a random overdubbed project as well, which David Gilmore memorably uh said it was awful fucking awful uh, was his description of it so they abandoned that and then um i think i think i'm right in saying that it was a sort of accident in the end they fed they were messing around with this leslie cabinet this thing it's it's a kind of cabinet with a rotating horn inside it mm. it's the thing famously which john lennon had applied to his voice on um tomorrow never knows to make him sound like a dalai lama you know, calling on down the, from the Tibetan mountain. The mountain peak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a gadget which is very much passed into rock legend. And for some reason they fed they'd fed Rick Wright's keyboard or his piano through it for some reason. And he started playing a little piano note and it sounded like a kind of sonar 
um, note that you get in a submarine. Mm. And they were taken with this, th- uh, just purely with this sound, and they started to experiment. And they came up with this thing, all these little sorts of little random pieces, and they were all called nothing. Nothing one, nothing two, nothing three, three. nothing four. By the time they got into the studio in January of 71, the track that was going to become Echoes had started to coalesce. And mm. its original title, because they premiered it live long before they, you know, finalised the recording of it, it was it was called Return of the Son of Nothing. Unlike Atom Heart Mother, this actually was the track that birthed the Pink Floyd that then went on to do The Dark Side of the Moon, which you yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe even mm. Animals as well. There's some stuff on Animals, I think, which you can kind of hear. Yeah, that, that sound or that that kind of aesthetic was born um, mm. in Echo. So it's interesting that it, it kind of was, it was an organic, it was an organic process again. There was nothing that they did that they kind of said, right, we need to do this because that didn't work. It was just their usual way of working, which was random, starting from right nothing. See, yeah. But for some mm. reason, this time it kind of paid off and you end up with this immense, immense track, really. 22 minutes, is it? Side it's two of... Something like that. It's, yeah, it's just an incredible piece of work really um and yeah i mean i think it's just it's the most it demonstrates them at their best at their most kind of majestic and you know with their use of just light and dark as well in the track and the di- using dynamics of the instruments is just astonishing really um yeah i mean i i recall listening to it um when i was in greece in a taverna on the beach probably at a early 90s and I can't actually remember it was sort of dusk and I think that they'd sort of finished serving for the evening or you know whatever and the sort of the girls were going around clicking the tables and stuff and they used to always play I mean there was always music playing in the taverna whatever because people would bring tapes and they'd stick them in you know and and it would just happen to be metal and and echoes and I just remember that it was there was a sunset over the sea so I was sat there and just listening to echoes playing and just with the sun just going down and the kind of this beautiful orange kind of blue sky with Mm. and it was just absolutely just one of those magical moments where the music in the environment that you're in just perfectly Mm. encapsulates the kind of the environment i'll never forget it It was just astonishing there could well have been other people there but i felt like i was the only person (laughs) in the world you know this was just yeah. almost like it was just for me mm. it was like in- incredible um and i've i've loved the piece ever since really um mm. even though i'd heard it beforehand but I, that, I think at that point i really appreciated it for just what a amazing piece of music mm. and song that it is you know your experience of echoes one thing i forgot to mention is that originally it was uh it was composed as part of a soundtrack by a film director and ardent surfer called George Greenoff. And he'd made, a docu- he'd made a documentary film celebrating his love of surfing. It was called The Crystal Voyager. And some of those scenes were actually used later on by Floyd themselves as part of, you know, on their screen when they were performing Echoes. Right, okay. Because there are, there are lyrics, aren't there? There's kind of references to coral caves and uh, mm. green green submarines and... We should talk about the lyrics probably because Roger always says that this is where his lyrical um, angle started to properly drift into focus. He always name checks the lyric, strangers passing in the street by chance two separate glances meet and I am you and what I see is me. Mm. And he always he always said that that was the birth of his social or political consciousness where he realised that, you know, we're all one essentially. It's that kind of... You know, you can sort of pigeonhole it as being a bit hippy dippy, yeah. and the and the early verses, the early verses, I must admit, they do sound a little bit hippy dippy. Overhead, the albatross, the albatross hangs motionless upon the air. Yeah, yeah. What yeah, do you yeah. make of that? It's, it almost sort of dates it back to a time of um, innocence. It's a bit airy, and you're just kind of uh, being a bit zen in the moment, just kind of just taking in this you know an observation but it's you're not really commenting on it you know it doesn't make you know what I mean it's just it's there you're there and and it's just in the moment and yeah um yeah I don't know it doesn't kind of uh it's a lovely lyric I mean the lyrics are very are are kind of 
quite beautiful in some respects, but they're not, uh, I don't know, that, that maybe they, they give the impression of being profound more than they actually are, perhaps, maybe. Musically, I could get very, very pretentious about Echoes. It's interesting that they started with this concept of nothing, nothing one, nothing two, nothing three, because to me, it always seems like it's a study in how nothing can become something. You know, it starts out at the beginning with just these kind of sonar pips mm. and it's incredibly abstract and then it mm. starts to build and coalesce and then it kind of turns into this something it you know it turns into a rock song essentially mm. and then it, that classic floyd thing it all starts to sort of break down again section in the middle where you can just hear those strange kind of keening seagull kind of sounds and it sounds oh, yeah, almost yeah, like yeah. it's just it's just gone down into this uh into this primordial state soup yeah, so, yeah, yeah, kind of thing. Yeah, and then and there's and there's a, a and there's a moment in the song which almost brings me to tears. It's about fifteen minutes in where they kind of drift out of that, and this organ chord appears, Rick Wright's organ. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Appears yeah. again, and to me, mm. it always sounds like it's an evocation of, um, you know, the moment where life is created. Birth, yeah. And you've gone from this mm. state of possibility into a state where you now maybe have this thing in a womb almost, and it mm. gradually starts to build. And then this extraordinary moment, I think, at about the 18 minute mark, it's the most amazing section in it, just before the, you know, the voices come back in and you get back into the song again. Mm. It just seems to open into this really panoramic, kind of amazing vista where the guitars seem to kind of swell up, don't they? Yeah. And you get this kind of sense of epiphany. I, I just think it's amazing. I think he's, uh, he's 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 he just like paints pictures with his guitar. I think Gilmore, he's an astonishingly artistic guitar player, you know. And it's all for the feel of the song, you know. It's you never feel, you never feel that it's it's over the top. It works perfectly for the song, and he's and he's always playing for the song. And I think Rick Wright did that with the keyboards as well. I mean, the two of them just musically just seem to work so well together and essentially and that's probably why in a way maybe their voices as well they just seem to be on the same wavelength the the the, the close harmony that they do the two of them on the vocals is beautiful mm. really uh you know and it just really carries the the narrative of the song along just really really well yeah i think in a way it helped to stop floyd being or being bracketed with the prog rockers and it made them, mm. I think it sort of, it made them more accessible to an audience that was maybe more into something like, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash yeah. or, you know, some of that West Coast stuff. Mm. It seemed much less to do with the kind of yes type proggy King Crimson thing, which is all about, you know, abrasiveness and, and sort of trying to slam together these disparate ideas and, you know, trying to, mm. I guess, be a bit pretentious, I suppose you could say, if you you know, being unkind to those bands, whereas Floyd on this, I think on this piece, they discover this very natural, organic sound. And Gilmore and Wright's vocals, like you say, are, yeah. are a really intrinsic part of that. I must say there's one section of the song that I don't care for that much, and that is the uh, the kind of the bluesy, funky section, which I think it goes on too long. They do it on Money on the next album and they, mm. they take about 16 bars or something in Money and do a bit of a jam. You know, you're, mm. on this record, it's about three and a half minutes of this rather sort of ploddy blues sort of jamming. And I, I, I just find it a bit mundane, really. I, I'm always really pleased when it then kind of sinks into the primordial soup and you start to get <laughs> kind of more abstract, I think. And yeah. I, I really hate to say it because because you've been very fulsome in your praise of Gilmore, but I do think... I do think Gilmore sometimes introduces a slight element of bluesy kind of, oh God, we're into a blues, we're into a bit of a blues jam section now because Dave can do really good blues guitar. What do you think? Maybe. I don't know, just a bit generic for about, um, maybe about three minutes and then it starts to get interesting again. Yeah, it is, it is. And I mean, it's, you know, I, I suppose, um, again, it's this thing maybe I mentioned as well on for She Heart Attack sometimes with solos and things, you know, um, how guitarists and, and 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 especially gifted guitarists can really, because of their ability, they they can. But does that necessarily mean that they should? If you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I mean, it 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 doesn't really outstanding stay as well. I mean, it's, it's only about 
as you say, is about maybe three minutes, is it? Three, maybe it, it kind of seems longer for you because you don't particularly enjoy it and you're kind of wanting him to wind his neck in a bit and get onto the, the primordial yeah. soup bit, you know, but... Well, to be um, fair, to be fair on David, it's 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 Rick Wright as well. He's doing a bit of that sort of Hammond D, you know. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think live it would be great. I just think on a record, I think you need to rein that in. But it is, you know, it is the early seventies. I'm sure we can forgive them a bit of well, you know, the odd the odd three minutes of self indulgent noodling. You know, it is Pink Floyd at the end of the day, isn't it? Moving backwards, then we need to now just talk about side one. So obviously, side one starts with this great track one of these days which everybody mm. will know starts with the yeah. sound of howling wind and then you get this bass guitar played through a binson echo unit i believe right and uh it kind of explodes into this kind of space rock epic doesn't it inspired yeah. i think probably by the bbc radiophonic workshop there's definitely tinges of doctor who coming through here isn't there <laughs> with the ding, 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 ding. yeah 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 i think it's a double I think it was double tracked, uh, two bass guitars. I think Gilmore's playing one, obviously Waters is playing the other. And I think one is like with the older strings to give it more kind of rattle, okay. perhaps. So uh, when, it, when I read about that and then I listened to the record again this morning, I thought, yeah, you can really hear that, you know, because I mean, obviously there's a lot of echo and effect put onto it. Um, but it's... Um, it's hypnotic, isn't it? It's really, um, yeah. you know, and, and it's funny, actually, because you, you get kind of pulled along with it, with the, with the kind of the, this, this, this hypnotic bass line. And, um, and then it's almost when Gilmore's heavy fuzz guitar comes in, it's almost like the spell is broken then. It kind of snaps you out of it. Well, that's how, that's how I find it anyway. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a really compelling instrumental isn't it it's um mm. i seem to recall they did a they did a an animated um piece with a kind of like a almost like a ballet dancer dancing with it or there were some dancers uh, i seem to recall seeing um clips from live concerts that they'd done where they when they played that they actually mm. had had this this animated piece that they used to play to accompany it I don't know. You I probably don't maybe remember. Yeah. Seen. Well, I saw yeah. them in '87, and they did perform this song, but I don't. I don't remember what the film clip was. But um, yeah. when, when they did the live version in '87, and this was immortalized on the Delicate Sound of Thunder album, they actually Rick Wright does play the complete Doctor Who theme in the middle. Um, oh, really? Because on the studio version, you only hear one little phrase. You hear the woo woo kind of thing. But right, I think it was definitely their nod of the hat. And I'm going to say. Did this track invent space rock? I'm not entirely sure with the chronology of when when Hawkwind were doing their stuff, early 70s. This track feels like a kind of pioneering piece of music, doesn't it, in a way? Mm. It seems to it seems to happen round about the time that all that kind of stuff was starting to happen. But I guess its roots are in the yeah. late late sixties kind of scene as well. So I wouldn't want to say this track invented a genre, but it seems to be one of the earliest manifestations of this kind of trancey mm. um well yeah trancey is the best word i can think of just the same thing yeah. repeating and getting more and more kind of compelling you know it is i mean it's definitely um it, it's interesting that you mentioned hawkwind because being a london-based band they would have probably have crossed paths at some stage wouldn't they and they certainly wouldn't have would have attended it each other's gigs i guess wouldn't they at that period it's some great great slide work from gilmore in one of these days really yeah really immense um slide guitar playing i didn't know that gilmore and waters were both playing the bass i always assumed it was just waters so that's quite an interesting little bit of information no, it's definitely it's, it's a double tr double track from both playing but cool. to, with the, the strings different condition of the strings to give it obviously yeah. a, a different timbre and stuff i suppose so and then you've yeah. got Nick Nick Mason making his vocal debut. I believe it's him. He's the he's the yes, voice which says so. one one of these days I'm gonna cut you yeah. into little pieces. Apparently, um, it was it was sung in falsetto and then played at normal speed. Oh, <laughs> or you're a mine. You're a mine of information this afternoon. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> Uh, and then yeah, so then it goes. It it returns to the to the howling wind again, and me being pretentious again for the moment. Again, it's this theme that seems to run through the record of something emerging from nothing and then returning to nothing again. With the sort of it's the howling wind this time, which is meant to be emblematic in my 
mind of the kind of nothingness just this kind of howling nothing kind of storm in the distance and then this this yeah. incredible track rises up out of it and then just goes back into the howling wind again so then we go into pillow of winds which mm. i just think is a beautiful absolutely it is beautiful it's lovely song. isn't it yeah yeah and i was going to ask you about this this song and fearless which is the one that comes after because i know that you're a big fan of what they call acid folk it, mm. it, it's not something that i know a great deal about but i mean would you say that pillow of winds to me it sounds very modern it sounds like a lot of bands that you hear nowadays who use acoustic sounds in a very peaceful way in a kind of bucolic spaced out kind of way that kind of folky thing i mean floyd never mm. really did a huge amount of folk music did they you don't think of pink floyd and folk usually in the same mm. breath you think of blues you think of rock you think of psych metal mm. might be the only album where the folk thing in these two tracks anyway it seems mm. To my ears, it seems to be acid folk. Yeah, it's it's the style of it actually is is interesting because I think certainly there's I think there's two acoustic guitars if I'm not mistaken, but I think there's definitely there's a there's a kind of arpeggiated uh, way that Gilmore's playing with the with the acoustic, and I, I think it's kind of similar to the the style that was kind of. Uh, that Donovan used to play a lot called the Claw, okay. yeah, uh, which is what kind of I think he taught Lennon and McCartney when they were in Rishikesh in mm. in sixty eight, you know, um, which is why obviously they came back and they did sort of you know Blackbird and uh, you know Julia and those kind of songs, and it's got that kind of lilting ding 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 ding, so it's kind of it's um, yeah um which just again it just produces this lovely lilting fluffy streamy mm. kind of uh, bliss sign of kind of um yeah you know and i mean you know i think um again folk guitarists like roy harper played in that style as well yeah i mean you could argue there is a, there is a a sort of maybe an acid folk kind of thing there you know there was like artists like you know groups like spira gyra in the early 70s doing that and so on it is very early 1970s traffic as well mm. actually that kind of vibe you know heading out to the country playing our guitars by the bubbling stream you know as the sun comes up it's, yeah. it's just got that kind of and the words as well to pillow of winds it's all just about him just kind of you know lying there with his woman isn't it really it's very very um I say almost romantic, really, which is not not a word you'd often use for Pink Floyd. Uh, it is. It's yeah. I think I read somewhere that it's one of the only kind of real kind of love songs in their catalogue. To be honest. Mm. Um, so, but it's it, it is. It's just got that that blissed out, soporific kind of feel um, mm. about it. It's uh, but yeah, as you say, it's it's a ra it's a rarity in their catalogue. Definitely, there's not many. Certainly, and I was but, just. I was just checking the songwriting lyrics as well to both Pillow of Winds and Fearless. It's interesting how they're both Waters Gilmore collaborations, which was mm -hmm. not something that I was, I guess it did happen, but Dark Side of the Moon is largely written by Roger on his own. Um, mm. I think it was Wish You Were Here is mostly Waters on his own. And then Animals, you start to get the Gilmore Waters collaboration again happening. And there's a few tracks mm. on the wall where they work together. But these two tracks on metal, um, Pillow of Winds and Fearless, being by Dave and Roger together, it's almost like, OK, this is where Floyd could have gone in the future mm. if Waters um, hadn't decided to appropriate Floyd for his own you know, political ends and we can talk about that a bit as we get towards the end of the video but mm. to me metal is the moment where they seem totally together not just them actually but all all four members of the band there's no rancor Absolutely. there's no rancor yeah. at all it's not even on the horizon it doesn't seem to be even a kind of distant prospect the band mm. haven't made it yet they're still very tight they've gone through this period where they've been trying to find an identity and now it's kind of starting to gel and i think these these two songs because they're very tight well-written songs i think they really sound like ah right okay gilmore and waters as a songwriting team is is actually now starting to happen and it's a shame i suppose that it didn't that was not really the way that things were going to shape up long term fearless i guess is is a bit is a bit different it's got more of a kind of mid-tempo um rock yeah. 
pulse to it with this brilliant ascending guitar line you know the dan 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 very very satisfying it, it's, it's a, a very i remember years ago i i took part in this all night jam session with you know a couple of friends and we kind of stayed up all night it was just what you know one of, one of those crazy nights that you can remember all your life and we we just slipped into playing um fearless and it was so good it felt so the riff and just the way it just keeps circling back on itself and building up again and then mm -hmm. back again really really nice piece of songwriting and just a great performance i think yeah it's got that c to b flat kind of change with a dun, 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 which is interesting it's actually funny when i was listening to it again this morning which is something that i've never thought of before is that when it comes in and the feel of it with that kind of loose mid-tempo acoustic thing it reminds me a little bit of later buffalo springfield or mm. early early neil young even that kind of country slightly country loose country kind of feel um and again i mean you know it was the time of crosby stills nash and as you mentioned before and maybe they would they you know i'm sure that you know because they were incredibly popular then that they were picking up on stuff like mm. that and you know what everybody borrows off everybody else don't they to a certain extent i suppose but, uh... i think that's what makes the album so interesting is that it is a kind of it's a floyd that briefly came into existence it needed to exist in order to uh morph and develop into you know dark side wish you were here but i think even by the time of dark side because roger had decided he was going to kind of steer them into different lyrical waters mm. no, no pun intended um you know with the kind of dark side stuff Metal is the moment where they could have gone off more into a Crosby, Stills and Nash, West Coast kind of thing. And we could have had a succession mm. of albums through the 70s that were basically um, moulded on the fearless kind of template, which, like you say, is mm. this kind of blissed out, but, you know, quite sort of firm and solid folk mm. rock kind of sound. I, th I, I do think it's a shame. And it, it's one of the reasons I, I always kind of say, I think at the end of the day, I do sort of prefer metal to Wish You Were Here and Animals, even though I know I know those albums do create uh, do have fantastic moments in them. But mm. there there always just seems to be something else going on with those records. Like on Wish You Were Here, you've got this creeping sense of um, despondency, I suppose, and then mm. on Animals, it's morphed into something which I guess you describe as being pissed off, you know, um, aggressive really quite dark punky, you know so punky kind of that. Yeah, yeah sort of punky slightly nasty yeah. thing whereas metal yeah. i do think metal catches the band at just a really really nice moment in their career in terms of them just just having a good time in the studio and, and they sound yeah. like they're enjoying each other's company and i think pillow of winds and fearless really do represent that coming together and then i guess we should finish our musical journey with the record just by mentioning the two tracks stuck out on the end of side two which uh side one rather um saint tropez and seamus which were a very odd mm. pair of tracks because the floyd generally didn't do filler uh no. they, they tended to either even the tracks which you might not like they tended to have something about them which made them like really oh, i really don't like that but these two songs they just they did they mm. they really do seem like place fillers don't they yeah i mean i used to play it around at my mate's house who was a big fan of the album he loved floyd anyway but but he never liked those two songs, and I think, I, th I think he actually he he actually hated Seamus even more than Saint Tropez, which is weird because Saint Tropez is kind of quite quirky in a kind of jazzy sort of way. Um, I actually don't mind it to be honest. I think as I've got older, I've kind of, I've got, <laughs> yeah. I I, th I think I mean back back in the in the eighties. I mean I was just it was just I, I loved the rock. The dynamic stuff, you know, um, that kind of stuff was what I wanted to listen to from Pink Floyd. I didn't want to hear mm. kind of jazzy stuff, really, you know. Um, and, and my mate, he always used to say, oh, God, not these bloody two tracks again. You know, but we were <laughs> usually kind of too stoned or drunk to take the thing off. So we just kind of put up with it. And yeah. just say, oh, it's only they're only short, you know, don't worry about it. A few minutes and it'll all be, all be over. Time to turn the the record over you know because uh and we'd always play echo mm. second because it's almost like you needed that kind of antidote mm. after listening to them but maybe that's been a bit mean i don't know but you know um seamus uh was actually um and the the dog is um 
uh, was Steve Marriott's dog. Yes, I did know that. Yeah. And Dave Gilmore was was uh, was was kind of looking after him, obviously while he was away or touring or something. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just a sort of curious yeah. little little. Have thing. you seen Have you seen the footage of them actually recording with the dog? It's on the Live at Pompeii DVD. There's a sort of extra section at the end where they're all gathered around this dog and they're sort of holding a microphone and they're playing oh, nice. um, Seamus live on acoustic yeah. guitars. And the dog is doing a lot more singing, you know, howling yeah. in, in time to the music. So oh, Rick Wright's got the microphone. Yes, that's he? right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have seen that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's sort of ridiculous, but it's sort of yeah. got a bit, of a bit of charm about it, hasn't it? But, um, you know. My my opinion with these two tracks is that they I think that they are a kind of um, mental leftover in the Floyd's mind from their soundtrack work. You know, if you if you listen to those albums like um, Obscured by Clouds and uh, was it more? Mm. Um, you know, those because they're soundtrack albums, they don't they you know they don't need artistically to be these very sort of coherent statements. Those two records, I think, gave the Floyd an opportunity to just sort of, you know, try a little bit of this, try just a little bit of that. Let's mm. have that. Let's have this. And to me, these two tracks at the end of side one of metal, they sound like Floyd haven't quite yet kind of realised, actually, this album is not like that. This is shaped up to be something which if we just I think what they should have done is they should have reprised one of these days after Fearless. A right. bit like you know the uh, the um, wish you were here thing, where they start the album with shining your crazy diamond and then the bring it back in it. at the end. If yeah. you if if you imagine a, you know an alternative record where after fearless you somehow mm. go back into a, one of these days things and you somehow tie the side up into a kind of you know a proper coherent statement. And it is odd because mm. side two is obviously a coherent statement. Is obviously an attempt mm. to do something. And it's always slightly defeated me wondering why why did they just stick these two songs on the end? But I suspect. I just don't think maybe they properly twigged yet. Yeah, we don't need to do this anymore. We can actually be mm. a bit more kind of integrated with it. But it is what it is, yeah. you know. I don't hate either of the tracks. I just always feel like oh, it's a shame. It's a shame we can't have a more sustained mood, really. Yeah, it's interesting with the sequencing actually, because I think on the version of Live at Pompeii that I had, that had the extra bits, like with the Seamus bit as you've mentioned, I seem to recall that because they they split echoes into two parts don't they so the the video starts with echoes part one and then it comes back in with the, the soup bit you know with the keyboard and the digga -da -digga -da -digga -da, you know the gilmore guitar and then i think uh that the seamus bit the bit with the dog as that ends they then go into echoes part two so it's okay. kind of that's almost like mirroring how it is on the on the studio album you know when we get into dark side they've certainly um taken another step towards you know becoming more conceptual and mm. more symphonic or whatever you want to call it you know more trying to tie loose ends up into a kind of structured thing everything cross-fading mm. into everything else and there's clearly been a bit of evolution there but would you say that you know i think i think metal is is the transition album really and there's there's Definitely. seeds of stuff which they plant on this album and i think you can even you know you can hear it in um say you know dogs on animals and also sheep both contain songs where you get that primordial soup again don't you like in dogs mm -hmm. is that quite long section where it's just rick wright's organ playing yeah. kind of st strange abstract stuff sheep yeah breaks down into that strange Lord's Just Prayer. With the bass going and then the, the, the keyboards and then like you say the Lord's Prayer coming in, yeah. And um yeah, I think I think they I think they just they just loved atmospheres. I think that's the thing, you know, it's just creating these um haunting atmospheres, you know, which I mean Echoes is, isn't it? It's just it's full of, you know, the primordial soup bit is is incredibly haunting and mm. you know, um like you say, I mean, you could listen to that and it could just be like a barren wasteland. And then other people, as you say, you saw it as a kind of everything like, kind of, I don't know, the, you, could, you know, I don't know, in, in astrophysics, there may be something like a quantum foam or something like that. You know what I mean? Like the absolute yeah. building blocks of life down to its absolute lowest common denominator kind of thing. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. And you hear that. I think yeah. you hear that. Again, I'm not sure of the chronology of it, but it, it really reminds me of the early 
Tangerine Dream. Um, mm. Was it the Island Years? Was that what there was signed to Island originally, weren't they? And they did those albums like Zeit and oh, those yeah. albums, which were very sort of taking the Floyd primordial thing and actually yeah. just just kind of staying there, really. You know, not not going anywhere. Just yeah. Like... You yeah, know, for twenty minutes or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to sum up, my personal view is, I I would have loved it if there would have been a couple more medals in the catalogue. I think mm. to me there was a missed opportunity. There was this great, great album, and then I think because of what Roger Waters decided to do, which was to steer them off into the, you know, quite political territory. You did get some great albums after that, but I think from Dark Side onwards, the seeds of the band's destruction have been planted. They're starting mm. to pull in different directions. I think it would have been nice to have had another couple of these just warm, fuzzy, kind of nice sounding records where they were mm. all pulling in the same direction. But I don't it's know difficult what you think. when you've got yeah, difficult when you've got somebody who's such a key member of the band who's just getting more bitter and angry as kind of time goes on. I think, <laughs> isn't it? No, it's it is a wonderful album, and it's it's great to revisit it again because it's been a while since I've played it. Righto. Well, thank you very much, Rob, Excellent. for joining me for that excursion thank into you. the depths of early seventies Pink Floyd. So, um, thank you again. Yeah, yeah, you're very welcome. So, viewers, let us know what you think of metal Pink Floyd. Is it is it mid table? Is it at the top end? Is it at the bottom end? I don't whether anybody thinks it's at the bottom end. I, I think people generally no. think that metal is up there, isn't it? But it, it's not yeah. always considered to be. You know, one of the zenith. Big, no. Yeah, I think for most people it falls slightly outside the true mm. kind of you know the, the big albums. But I would rather listen to Metal than The Wall any day of the week. And I speak as somebody oh, yeah. who used to think that The Wall was the greatest album of all time. You know, when I was kind of sixteen, but now at the yeah. age of fifty-two, um, you know, Metal makes a lot more sense to me than The Wall does. So I, I've said this to a couple of people. I think that I loved The Wall when I was like. 13, 14. I think it speaks to angry, angsty, angry teenagers. Yeah. Definitely. And that kind of sense of rebellion. And mm. but it doesn't just kind of I don't know. I don't really want to go there anymore. It's just too much, <laughs> too much nihilism, too much negativity, you know. There's yeah, enough of that in the world as it is. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Whereas metal speaks very firmly to the kind of old codgers in the audience, doesn't it? Which is what we undoubtedly are, let's face it. <laughs> yeah, well, I was going to say speak for yourself, but I guess I've got to put myself... Well, you're older than me, Rob. You can't, so you can't get off the hook there. No, no, no. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, that's Good stuff. Good. <laughs> anyway, yeah, thanks for watching, everybody, and we'll catch you all later. See you soon. Cheers, James. <laughs>